Good afternoon again. We are here for a very happy event. We are uh, welcoming one of the great writers of our time, Amitav Ghosh, and we are, uh, with his presence, uh, launching the uh, new center for the International Center for the Humanities and Social Change. And so, um, uh, let me introduce, um, of course, uh, our <coughs> Magnifico Rettore, Professor Michele Bugliesi, and the Chairman of the Humanities and Social Change International Foundation, uh, Eric Rickmers. So, uh, I'll ask Michele Bugliesi and then Eric Rickmers to Thank you. So, hello everybody and, and welcome, as, as um, Shaul just said. Uh, it's a double event. Uh, we're welcoming a, a most distinguished uh, guest today who will speak about humanities and, ch and social change. And as the first event uh, of, uh, of, of the initiative we are uh, we're inaugurating today. Uh, the initiative is, is one that I am extremely happy and proud of. It's the, the first uh, center of the International Foundation for the Humanities and Social Change whose chairman is here with us, is a friend who I met uh, in March uh, last year. It's 14 months uh, today, and it's been a growing relationship that has, been, has converged towards this, this initiative. The, the International Foundation is Mr. Rickmers, Herr Rickmers, uh, entrepreneur, a German entrepreneur, who has decided to uh, donate to make a, a, a significant donation for the establishment of the foundation who will talk about that uh, himself uh, and as part of that initiative he started he's decided to, to fund a network of, of centers to, uh, uh, to study um, the, uh, the, the the transformations that have been um, you know, that we have witnessed over over the decades now uh, generated by globalization and all the processes that have uh, spurred from from that from that um, um, from it from, from globalization itself. So uh, all the changes in, in labor, in economy, in distribution of, of wealth, the tensions, the social tensions, the religious tensions, the cultural uh, diversity has been you know has generated uh, all the. Uh, the, the flows, the migrations, with all the, the social impact that, 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 that those phenomena have, uh, have generated. All that will be uh, a subject of study uh, in the center that is being created today, in, that is being initiated today, in, in inaugurated today in Venice, as part of a network, as I said, uh, which has already a twin center in, uh, in, uh, in the uh, United States, in California, at the University of Santa Barbara, which is uh, Represented here today with Tom, Professor Tom Carlson from from the the, the, human, the faculty of the humanities over there. The center in Venice is, is directed and led by Professor Shaul Bassi. You all know him as a uh, very active uh, uh, um, um, professor uh, in literature and, and much engaged in in in, uh, in the cultural events in the city. Uh, cross wars of civilizations, one of them, Kochi Chivita, the merchant of Venice here, and many others. Uh, the other members of the of the uh, of the steering committee of the center are uh, Tiziano Ripiello, my vice director and sinologist, and, and uh, an expert in, in, in uh, Western, in, sorry, Eastern philosophy, uh, Far East philosophy. Um, Sabrina Marchetti, a sociologist, uh, expert in labor and, uh, and the 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 uh, effects of labor with, uh, with immigration, uh, with household, uh, essentially labor, and Massimo Varley, who is here again uh, with us. Uh, he is a, a behavioral economist uh, which, uh, who is analyzed, you know, expert in analysis of, of social phenomena, uh, also on the, on the, on the social uh, media, on the media, and on the, in the, in the, in the, at the large scale. Uh, Mr. Rickmers and the foundation has uh, funded the center uh, with, with seed funding for over a million uh, euros with which we will activate, ah, Sabina Marquette is also over there, sorry, didn't see. Uh, um, in, uh, seed funding for, for, uh, for positions in research uh, at different levels, so we'll be recruiting uh, for um, temporary researchers on the program, uh, Shaul maybe will, will, will talk about that a little more. 
but so on, on the different uh, areas and angles, uh, so different points of view from which the, the themes of the center can be approached. So both um, uh, on literature, humanities, philosophy, and quanti quantitative uh, approaches to the analysis of, 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 of the change. So four researchers, four PhD students, uh, recruited and again on the different programs we have in the in, in Kafoskari, and three more for this year uh, postdocs, which will be followed by nine more in the years to come. So it's three year program that we established today. We're starting today and will continue for the next three years, and we very much hope and and will do our. I mean, we, we count on that. We'll continue over um, over, over you know uh, this this initial phase with with further development. Um, we have uh, we will be allocating the center in one of our um, uh, sites in, in Kafoskari in uh, uh, as at the initial phase and coordinate with the other centers of the network uh, with with Santa Barbara to start. Uh, I'm, let me just uh, finish this to let the floor, to give the floor to, to Eric, uh, thanking him uh, and expressing my deepest you know, on behalf of the of, of uh, Kafoskari and of Venice indeed uh, uh, for uh, for his donation and for his vision. Uh, the project is, uh, is very much uh, fit, uh, well fit for for what Kafoskari expresses in terms of disciplines and of the mission that has that our university has, has carried out since the foundation. Uh, like uh, Venice, where we live, and we, like the city we love and that hosts us, uh, Kafortis has been uh, an uh, uh, tackling the, the, these issues over, over time, uh, interpreting this uh, itself as, as one of the drivers to, to, to favor uh, uh, integration of cultures, of points of views, of an understanding, you know, the diversity and the complexity of, of this world from uh, from the point of view of, of, of economists, from the point of view of, of people uh, in the humanities and in, in the sciences in, 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 the, in the disciplines we, we cover. So, and of course, from the point of view of languages and cultures. So. Um, really happy about starting the project. It will be, give us a, a huge drive in the, our main, uh, in, you know, what, what are the main pillars of our core business. So uh, very, very much, uh, very many thanks to the foundation. We'll do a great job together and I look forward to the years to come and to the collaboration with the foundation and the, the twin centers. Thanks a lot. Signore e signori, sono molto felice di essere qui oggi sera. Eh, mi dispiace che, malgrado mia moglie sia italiana, di Bergamo, i nostri figli abitano due nazionalità, un passaporto tedesco e un passaporto italiano. Il mio italiano non è molto buono, per quello continuare in inglese. And the whole purpose of establishing this center is, of course, for me to have an opportunity to learn Italian. And, um, and I look forward that this will be a, a, an important um, side effect. Um, ladies and gentlemen, um, we live at a, time, at a time of unprecedented change. A change which is unfolding in many areas of the human society, um, technologically, environmentally, economically, and certainly also in our human culture. Unfortunately, so I must say, I'm deeply worried about most of that change uh, which is unfolding, and I think so are many people around the world. Uh, in many ways, we live about our means. Financially, global debt is rising, and we, in many areas, we build economic systems which are not sustainable, but certainly also in other walks of life, uh, and certainly concerning the environment. Hence, it's a great starting point for us to, uh, to, to uh, um, inaugurate the center uh, in cooperation with Kafoskari on 
on the subject of the humanities um, and uh, climate change. So this worry was the departure point for me to take an initiative. And the initiative is to bring together an interdisciplinary group of thinkers from all over the world and from various disciplines, but departing from the humanities and the humanistic social sciences to dwell upon the pressing problems of human society. Very generally, the question is, how do we want to shape our human culture going forward? How do we want to shape economic systems which seem not sustainable anymore? Capitalism is in crisis and we have to think of developing new criteria which make capitalism sustainable and adequate as an economic model for us to go into the future. Technology is very much capitalism driven. Um, we introduce every year new tools to human society without having thought about its consequences, the immediate consequences and of course the consequences in its second, third and fourth order, the knock-on effects of what will happen after we have enjoyed the possible short-term benefit. What are, the, uh, what are the consequences? Is human society really discussing what they want to have, what should be introduced and what shouldn't? Do we make conscious decisions about these important questions? And I think we don't. One of the, one of the things that, 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 that give me a particular worry is the dehumanization of the workplace. That we replace humans for capitalistic reasons, for economic reasons, by artificial intelligence, robotization, digitization, and so on. But what do we do with all these people? Yes, the intellectuals, the highly qualified, the highly qualified white collar people, they will find employment, they will find meaningful jobs where they create added value for society. But many people won't. And what do we do with them? And what does that mean, again, for, um, for our societies, which are already growing, where, where inequality is already growing more and more? It is not so well read by the statistics yet. But many people feel that they, they do not really participate in economic progress anymore. So, big topics. And I believe these big topics they are all interwoven and, and interconnected, but they are extremely complex. So the only chance to come closer to those, to the DNA, to the underlying questions uh, which help to solve the, uh, uh, the, the, the problems visible at the, at the surface, uh, the only way to, to come closer is in an interdisciplinary and, and inter, international uh, way, in a collaborative way and in an experimental way. So what we want to do is to bring together scholars from anthropology, philosophy, history, sociology, politics, philosophy, religious studies, my own major, um, uh, um, eco economics, of course, and bring those in an exchange with journalists, representatives of the media, people from the technology side, um, biotechnology side, electronics communication side, and global leaders of the business world, to create, a, to create platforms in various places where uh, these topics are discussed and where then research projects are being developed uh, which look more specifically into the various aspects I just described. So we decided to follow a two-step approach. The first step is the establishment of research centers in cooperation with various universities. And we have done so in cooperation with the University of Venice, Cap Foscari. We have done so in cooperation with the University of California in the United States. We're in an advanced dialogue, but we haven't yet concluded, and therefore I cannot say the name, with one of the first-class universities 
in the United Kingdom. And there will be a university in Germany, and it will probably be in Berlin. Um, that will be the first step, the establishment of four research centers, which are all, which all receive financing by the foundation. In a second step, we are aiming at creating an own academy campus, where we bring together thinkers from all over the world, an interdisciplinary group, and let them dwell upon some of these questions for a prolonged period of time. I strongly believe that communication by accident, so to speak, is, is very powerful. That people sit together and think together, and then they do something else, and then again they meet, and they go apart, and, and they have a prolonged exchange. And at one point, there will be creative ideas uh, at the table. You cannot put people together in a conference room and tell them from 10.30 to 11.30, please be creative and come up with new ideas. New ideas to complex questions do not come like that. They come only if you create the right environment for them to be born. So we call this our secular monastery. Um, we want to bring people together, interdisciplinary, non-partisan, open-ended thinking. We will not immediately take liberal democracy as the only form which must be accepted but really have an open-ended thinking where we also invite those people which we find appalling and disturbing um, in their presence in society but they must be involved as as part of our discourse so that is what we want to do um, and it's, um, it's, a, it's a great project. It has been uh, very enriching for me uh, personally um, because I, I met uh, wonderful people. Um, I, I feel a lot of positive feedback. Uh, many people feel that there's a real necessity for something like this, that it is a new approach, that it is um, something that um, fits very well into our time. Um, we are looking presently at locations of where would our own academy campus be built. Venice is one of the options. Um, we had today a wonderful tour and looked at three uh, possible uh, properties. Uh, tomorrow morning, however, I'm flying to Berlin and then we look at properties in Berlin and Potsdam, which is another alternative um, we are uh, considering. Uh, I can assure you though that... But it will be rainy in Berlin. Uh, I can assure you, though, that Michele and, uh, and Charles, they would, they would like to put me in chains and to make sure that it's happening here. And, uh, but actually, they have much better arguments. Uh, and they are working very hard on, on motivating us to be in Venice. And they're doing a good job in that. We, have to, we, haven't, we haven't made a decision yet. But I guess that a decision will be taken, a principal decision will be taken within the next uh, few months. And, um, and it may very well be um, that. Um, well, having said that, um, I uh, would like to thank you, Michele and Shaul, uh, for the hard work uh, over the last uh, year. We had um, endless uh, talks and um, exchanges, uh, negotiations. Uh, until we ended uh, up signing a contract at the end of uh, last year. And now we have started to roll out the project and, uh, and to make it happen. And it, it's a greenfield project. It is uncharted territory. We don't know actually where this journey will end, um, but I have provided uh, the financial means at least to make it a journey which will last into the medium term future. And I'm very excited uh, about it uh, and, uh, and, and hope that we will come up with uh, some great results and in all humbleness with some great results to the uh, betterment of societies. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Let me now ask Amitav Ghosh and Thomas Carlson to join us here at the table. Only a few minutes before we get into the talk, we're all 
looking forward to. Just allow me a few words, the essential about this uh, exciting enterprise have been already described. Uh, I just want to share a few words of thanks, of gratitude. Thank you very much to Eric Rickmers for his vision, his generosity. Um, it's been a pleasure to work with him and his staff, Stephanie Rotter, Victor Henkel, Pontonis Mark, and the other friends. Thank you very much to our rector, Michele Bugliesi, for embracing this vision, sharing this vision with a lot of enthusiasm. And this was not something we uh, necessarily take for granted from such an important institution. So now this partnership is really um, working. Um, it's been a great pleasure to work uh, in our advisory committee with uh, Tiziana Lipiello, Sabrina Marchetti, and Massimo Varlian, just to um, remind you, over the next three years, uh, the center will recruit over 20 scholars in different disciplines and at different levels that will engage with various projects. And you, if you want to know the details, uh, there is the website on our Kafoskari um, page that was put online today. Um, thank you to Donata Grimani, the liaison between the foundation and the center here. And uh, thank you to the, our new project manager, Barbara Del Mercato. There are many other people who have contributed. We don't have the time to thank them uh, now. Um, just want to also remind us that today is the first of many public events that the center will hold in Venice, uh, true to the public mission that we all um, share. Special thanks to the over 80 Kafoskari colleagues who submitted applications for the project. This has mobilized enormous energy. It was a hard uh, task to choose amongst them, but we were very excited that uh, already the boundaries between disciplines have been pushed and challenged, and this is really a good, good sign. Um, it's been a pleasure to work with Professor Thomas Carlson, uh, uh, distinguished professor of philosophy of religion from UC Santa Barbara. The intellectual conversation has been very stimulating and we look forward to uh, a long and productive cooperation. Uh, the reason why many of us believe that the humanities have something to do with social change is because we've read the books by Amitav Ghosh. Um, Amitav Ghosh was born in Calcutta, grew up in India, Bangladesh, and Sri Lanka. Um, and he's the author of many wonderful books, The Circle of Reason, Shadow Lines in an Antique Land, Dancing in Cambodia, Kolkata Chromosome, The Glass Palace, The Hungry Tide, and the three volumes of the Ibis Trilogy, Sea of Poppies, River of Smoke, and Flood of Fire. And his most recent one is the one that we'll be discussing today, The Great Arrangement. Uh, Amitav Ghosh is the recipient of multiple international awards, and I'll ask him permission to skip the list of awards because it will take us forever. He's also a very important public intellectual. He has published widely in The New Yorker, The New Republic, The New York Times, and many other essays. Um, his books are uh, all available in Italian and often translated by our dear friend Anna Nadotti. He's also a former guest of Incroce di Civiltà in Pia Maziero here. Um, the um, humanities have been under attack in recent years and underfunded in many uh, public and private universities and we believe that humanities matter. This is one more reason why we're so grateful for the new center and I think it's quite appropriate that we begin the long journey of the International Center of Humanities and Social Change at Kafoskari with a book that in a way uh, meets the limits of the humanities. This is a book that also says that there is a crisis uh, in the climate crisis, let me briefly quote, is also a crisis of culture and thus of the imagination. Uh, this is a profoundly disturbing book, a book that demands that we get out of our comfort zone, our political comfort zone, our intellectual comfort zone, and I think this will be really the um, task of our center really not to stay within our comfort zone and to push the boundaries and to redraw the boundaries between academia and non-academia, between disciplines. And so um, this is a great uh, moment to begin and only a great humanist 
such as Amitav Ghosh could write a book that also is ready to admit that the humanities are in themselves in crisis in front of the great challenge that uh, climate change poses. One last word of thanks to Hasna Hena Mamtaz and Lucio de Capitani who took good care of Amitav during his Venetian stay. And now I think, uh, without we are ready, uh, Amitav Ghosh will make a presentation and then uh, Tom Carlson and I will have uh, some question for him. Ladies and gentlemen, Amitav Ghosh. Well, it's a, it's, it's a real privilege and a great, great pleasure to be here today for this extraordinary occasion, uh, the inauguration of the Center for the Humanities and Social Change. Uh, I think it's an amazing thing that uh, Eric Rickmas is doing, and um, uh, I, I'm really happy to be here at this uh, uh, extraordinary occasion. And thank you very much indeed uh, for inviting me to be here, uh, Rector Michaela Pugliese, uh, and uh, of course the inimitable Shaul Bassi, who is uh, such a sort of force of nature and because of whom I've been back uh, to Venice many times in these last few years. And thanks also to, to Thomas Carlson for participating in this. Uh, <coughs> uh, uh, in writing this book, The Great Derangement, I really have to sort of uh, contend uh, with my own ideas about writing the written word, how I write, and why my work has always been so completely focused uh, in a kind of logocentricism that is always focused upon the verbal. So I've, I've been struggling these last uh, couple of years since, I've, uh, since I finished the book to rethink the ways in which I write. And uh, one, of the th one of the things I've started to do is to work a lot more with, uh, with images. So I hope you will uh, indulge me uh, for showing you a, a number of images today. Uh, one of the strange effects of this era, in which humanity has emerged as a ge geological agent, is that it has reversed the temporal order of modernity. As I write in The Great Derangement, in the Anthropocene, that is to say, this uh, man-made era of climate change, those at the margins are now the first to experience the future that awaits all of us. I was made aware of this once again recently when I found myself in a place where the landscape could be read as a distillation of history, illustrating the movement of time from the past to the future. The place in question is a very unlikely one, a tiny island in the archipelago that was once known as the Moluccas or Spice Islands. The island is called Ternate, and it is now part of the province of North Meluku in the far eastern reaches of Indonesia. Ternate and the region around it is a creation of the Ring of Fire, the zone of seismic activity that encircles much of the Pacific Rim. The seas here are dotted with islands, and Ternate is one such. The surface of the island is nothing but the gently sloping cone of a volcano, Mount Gamalama, which rises from the sea floor to a height of over 5,000 feet. Uh, it's taller, really, than Etna. Mount Gamalama is not only act, uh, alive and active, it is in a state of ongoing detonation. The great naturalist, Alfred Russell Wallace, who spent three years on Ternate, wrote of its volcano that faint wreaths of smoke issue perpetually from its summit. Volcanoes are embodiments of creative destruction. In erupting, they also produce, nourish, and sustain. This was certainly the case with the great volcano of Ternate, which gave birth to a miraculous botanical species, Syzygium aromaticum, the tree that produces the clove. Trees were my teachers, wrote the poet Holderlin, and Ternate might well make the same claim. The islander's journey through time has indeed been shaped and guided by the gift of its volcano, the clove tree. 
These trees are the riddle with which the island's story begins. Why did the clove tree grow nowhere else on earth except Tarnate and the four islands to its immediate south? Each of these islands mirrors Ternate in shape and size. All of them are anchored by volcanoes, and all are tiny. It is as if this story were a real historic instance of those parables that are found in mythic and scriptural traditions around the world, of mankind being subjected to a test, as in the Garden of Eden. In this case, the test seems uncannily like a, like a controlled experiment with a marvelous gift, the clove, being placed with meticulous care on a few minuscule nodal points so that its catalytic effects could be precisely tracked as they radiated outwards across the oceans. It is a fact that for most of human history, every clove on Earth originated on Ternate and its sister islands. This makes the connections between this tiny archipelago and the worlds around it quite easy to trace. Cloves have, for instance, been found at an Aramean Assyrian archaeological site in Tel Ashara, Syria. They probably arrived there around 3,700 years ago, around 1,700 BC. Such was the demand for cloves in the ancient world that a cycle of trade and travel came into being that linked Ternate to the farthest shores of the Indian Ocean, from China which remained for millennia the single most important market for cloves to India, Africa, the Arabian Peninsula, Persia, and Mesopotamia. This map is, uh, is uh, by the famous uh, Arab geographer Alidrisi, and as you can see, uh, this doesn't seem to have a pointer, though, but uh, uh, as you can see, he represents Africa as circumnavigable. So this was clearly something that was, uh, that was not a surprise to many. By way of the Middle East and the Mediterranean, the clove made its way to Europe, another vital market, where again it quickly became an important article of trade, with its value mounting steadily through the Middle Ages. What made the clove the object of such intense desire? Cloves are the unbloomed flowers of the parent tree, plucked and dried when they are still buds. Their remarkable properties, their taste, fragrance, and efficacy as an anesthetic certainly had something to do with the desire they inspired. But contrary to modern myth, cloves and other spices did not owe their desirability to their preservative powers, which were actually far less effective than those of that commonest of household ingredients, salt. Yet, such was the value of spices in medieval Europe that a handful of cloves, nutmeg, or mace could buy a house or a ship. Why were these culinary condiments so greatly valued? The answer is simple, because spices connoted luxury. In the words of a culinary historian, quote, they were doubly desirable for being the privilege of the great and good, which is to say that those barriers themselves contributed in no small part to their allure. Like beggars clustered around uh, a restaurant window, the medieval poor could only look on and drool as the well-off spiced their meat. In effect, the clove was a primordial form of the commodity, a thing that is desired not so much for its uses as for what it represents. The clove's value lay in the gaze that others brought to bear on it. And it was the interlocking of mirrored desires that transformed it into a commodity and an object of speculation, a word that derives precisely from the Latin root for mirror, speculum. The clove thus became a symbol of luxury, conforming perfectly to the conception of wealth that Adam Smith arrived at uh, in his theory of moral sentiments, something that is desired not for the material satisfactions that it brings, but because it is desired by others. What made cloves desirable then was the phenomenon that René Girard identifies as mimetic desire, which in his definition is rooted not in basic appetites, but in the crossing of gazes with others. That people on every continent should desire smartphones and iPads seems self-evident to us in this age of globalization. But it is clear from the travels of Ternate's clothes 
that the island has been a node for a global crossing of gazes that dates back to antiquity. But globes were responsible also for a more intimate crossing of gazes across the eight miles of sea that separates Ternate from its immediate neighbor, Tidore, another volcanic island. Seen from the air, the two islands look like twins, their shapes mirroring each other. And the history, too, is uncannily similar to mythological stories of enemy twins. Everywhere that mimesis exists, says Girard, there is also envy and competition. Imitation is indeed the engine of rivalry. And so it proved to be with Ternate and its twin. Tidore was Ternate's only competitor as a globe exporting port, and their relationship was so competitive that it became a metaphor for rivalry around the world, even finding its way into one of Cervantes's exemplary novels of 1612. The, com the competition between the two islands was fostered also by the trade practices of the Indian Ocean, where it was the custom for maritime states to vie with each other to attract merchants to their ports. This tradition of rivalrous hospitality enriched both Ternate and Tidore, economically and culturally, by attracting merchants and traders from the far reaches of the Indian Ocean. Both islands came to be integrated into maritime networks that stretched beyond the Indian Ocean to the Mediterranean, linking them ultimately to Venice, which for several centuries possessed a monopoly of the spice trade in Europe. This monopoly gave other European maritime powers good reason to find a different route to the Indian Ocean. By doing so, they could at one stroke destroy Venice's hold on spices, weaken the Muslim states of the Middle East, and also eliminate the chain of middlemen who profited from the handling of spices on their journey to Europe. So it happened that spices became the grail that launched the great voyages of the Age of Discovery. They were the prize that caused Christopher Columbus, Vasco da Gama, and Ferdinand Magellan to hoist their sails. What they all hoped to do was to control the mechanisms of the spice trade and create monopolies. This trading practice was alien to the Indian Ocean, although it had long existed within the Mediterranean Sea, where it had been pioneered and enforced by the Venetian Republic. It was Venice, therefore, that established commodity monopolies as an aspirational model for newer emerging powers like Portugal. The implication of Vasco da Gama's discovery of the sea route to the Indian Ocean was not lost on Venice. When rumors of the Portuguese journey to the Indies began to spread, a notable Venetian spice trader, Girolamo Priuli, wrote in his diaries, quote, if this voyage from Lisbon to Calicut continues as it has begun, there will be a shortage of spices for the Venetian galleys, and their merchants will be like a baby without milk and nourishment. And in this, I clearly see the ruin of the city of Venice. He added, without the spice trade, the city will lose its money, the source of Venice's glory and reputation. The Venetian Republic's response to the Portuguese int intrusion into the spice trade was to join hands with their allies in the Mis Muslim Middle East. Venetian diplomats urged the Ottoman Sultan to, quote, put pressure on the kings in India to refuse spices to the newcomers. The Ottomans, for their part, were so concerned about the loss of the lucrative spice trade that they even threatened to destroy the holy places of Christendom unless the Portuguese voyages were stopped. They didn't destroy the holy places of Christendom because they liked the tourist dollars. <laughs> At the time of Vasco da Gama's voyage to India, the Malabar coast was the main source uh, of pepper, which was, in terms of quantity, the single largest component of the spice trade. But by weight, the spices that were found only in the Malaccas, cloves, nutmeg, and mace, were far more valuable than pepper, which was why the Portuguese set off to look for the spice islands very soon after reaching India. It was then that Ternate and Tidore became a palimpsest upon which the rivalries of Europe were to, multi to be multiply imprinted over the next two centuries, with effects that would devastate the islands. When the first Portuguese sailors landed in the Malaccas, the Sultan of Ternate made all haste to have them brought to his island, but only to find that what the Europeans wanted was not just access to his goods, but the exclusive right to them, 
a monopoly, in other words, a commercial practice that was foreign to the Indian Ocean. In similar fashion, when the first Spaniards, the remnants of Magellan's ex expedition, were sighted, the Sultan of Tidore hastened to bring them to his island. And not long afterwards, his descendants found themselves living in a palace that was flanked on both sides by massive Spanish forts. But it was only for a short time that the rivalries of Spain and Portugal were neatly superimposed on those of Ternate and Tidore. Other European rivals soon made their way to the Malaccas, most prominently the two rising powers of the early modern era, the Dutch and the English, who fought, with each other, fought each other with as much savagery as they did the people of the Malaccas. In 1621, in the Banda archipelago, the world's only source of nutmeg and mace, the Dutch carried out a virtual genocide, exterminating and enslaving almost the entire population of the islands. The massacre was carried out upon the orders of the man who secured the foundations of the Dutch Empire in the East <coughs> Indies, Jan Pieterzoen Cohen. And it was by no means incidental to his vision of the imperial project, which was summed up by the following words. We cannot carry out trade without war nor war without trade. I think these are the most important lines ever spoken uh, in the early modern era. The next year, officials of the Dutch East India Com Company tortured and beheaded 10 Englishmen and two of their associates on the island of Ambon. This incident, which came to be known as the Massacre of Amboina, became one of the victory victimary myths of the British Empire and was memorialized in a play by the poet John Dryden in 1673. Within Holland, however, the Dutch imperial project in the East Indies went almost unnoticed. The 17th century was the golden age of Dutch art, the era of Rembrandt, Vermeer, Jan Steen, and many other great artists. Yet the orderly bourgeois world that they depicted was almost devoid of reference to the distant islands on which its wealth was founded. Jan Kuhn's services did not go unrecognized, however. His massacres were rewarded with a special grant from the Dutch East India Company. But the massacre of Amboina did not immediately dislodge the English from the Spice Islands. For the next few decades, they clung tenaciously to a few toeholds in the southern Malaccas. In particular, to a small island con called Run, Pulau Run, which was the first British possession in Asia. Ultimately, they were evicted from there as well, but they did not relinquish their claim to the island, a fact that caused the Dutch so much concern that in 1665, they signed a treaty whereby Run was ceded to them by the British in exchange for another island on the other side of, that plan of the planet. And that island was none other than Manhattan, which would in time become a central node in the processes of financial and industrial acceleration that would drive our journey to the, into the Anthropocene. When magnetic rivalries cross a certain threshold of intensity, writes Girard, the rivals forget, misplace, or destroy the disputed objects and lay hold of one another directly. This is another axiom that is visibly imprinted on the landscape of Ternate and Tidore. Quite possibly, there is no corner of the earth that contains so dense a concentration of fortifications from the early modern era, built precisely by the powers that laid the foundations of our self-consuming modernity, the Portuguese, Spanish, Dutch, and English. Today, the remains of these forts, gun emplacements, and lookout points lie scattered across the archipelago like the cinders of a fire evidence of the astonishing energies that were once generated by the rivalry for spices. If not for them, it would be hard to believe that there was a time when tiny Ternate drew visitors like Louis Camoyes, author of Portugal's national epic, The Lusias, and Saint Francis Xavier, co-founder of the Jesuit order. The orgy of full fort building stopped as suddenly as it had begun. The island's first forts were built in the early 16th century, by the end of the 17th, when the Dutch had secured their hold on the East Indies, the construction boom was over. By the time the Dutch succeeded in imposing a monopoly on clothes, the mystique and market value were already slipping. 
By the late 18th century, the Dutch East India Company was mired in corruption and effectively bankrupt. <clears throat> Eventually, seedlings of cloves and nutmeg were smuggled out of the Malaccas and transplanted elsewhere. They became so widely and easily available that the idea that they must, might once have been the most desired commodities on earth now seems almost laughable. But the cycle of magnetic desire that exalted and eventually exhausted the clove would soon attach itself to other commodities in ever increasing numbers and ever deepening intensity, creating patterns of consumerism that would extend across the globe. Ultimately, it would bring into being, in our own era of globalization, a homogenization of desire on a scale never before seen, extending across the planet and into the deepest reaches of the human soul. Yet the intimate nature of the connections forged by these commodities has not led to greater cooperation or sympathy, as imagined by Hegel. On the contrary, it has only intensified and deepened resentment, anger, and envy. We were once told that countries where McDonald's was present would never fight each other. Exactly the opposite has proved to be the case. In Afghanistan, Arab fighters go into battle wearing clothes made by Gucci. American-made pickup trucks become both the symbol and the chosen weapon of the forever war. The so-called caliph of the Islamic State is seen to wear fancy watches. Jihadi volunteers in Syria are so attached to their iPhones and iPads that they return to Europe to buy new models. It is as if the clove had come back to haunt us in billions of new avatars. The clove, I quote, the clove is the precious commodity, wrote the 17th century Spanish historian Bartolomé Leonardo de Argentola which gives power and wealth to kings and causes their wars. This is the fruit of discord. For it there has been and still is more fighting than for the mines of gold. Written at the dawn of our era of planetary connections, these words are a prescient summation of the nature of mimetic desire and rivalry in the era of globalization. Despite Ternate's remoteness, from the great centers of contemporary trade, it is by no means a laggard in globalization. Indonesia is one of the fastest growing economies in the world, and evidence of this is everywhere visible on the island. In the great mass of vehicles, large and small, that throng its streets, and in the fast rising buildings that dot its villages. But Ternate's landscape possesses an additional marker of the Anthropocene. This too is etched upon its landscape and by none other than the island's tree of destiny, the clove. Across the island, clove trees are dying. In orchard after orchard, they stand in drooping clumps, their branches leafless, their trunks ashen. On the slopes of the volcano, clusters of dread, dead trees can be seen, their leaden colors contrasting vividly with the greenery. Those who tend to the trees are unanimous about the cause of their demise. The climate has changed in recent years, they say. There is less rain, and it falls more erratically. This, in turn, has led to the spread of blights and disease. The lack of rain has been accompanied by another unprecedented phenomenon, wildfires. In March 2016, a fire raged for three days on the slopes of Mount Gamalama. Forest fires of this intensity are new to the islanders' experience. The ongoing changes in the world's climate have thus placed the people of Ternate once again on the leading edge of history. The, trees that guide, that, the tree that guided their first steps in the world is now dying before their eyes. The uncanny realities of the Anthropocene have once again linked the island to faraway Venice, which, after having played such an important role in the acceleration of global commodity trade, has now itself, ironically, become dependent for its survival on its status as a commodity to be consumed by tourists. In this sense, Venice represents an essential aspect of the human condition in the Anthropocene. Its short-term survival depends on accelerating precisely those processes of desire and consumption that will ultimately spell its doom. 
If the history of the clove were indeed an experiment or a parable about human nature, then his conclusions would be unmistakable. For many centuries, Tagnati was ruled by a dynasty of sultans that was thought to have an especially intimate relationship with the island and its volcano. The, distant, the dynasty is a very old one, dating back to the 14th century, and some of its descendants still live on the island in the palace of the sultans. During my stay, I was fortunate to meet a prominent member of the dynasty, Hidayat Muzaffar Shah, a son of the late ruler. We sat in a courtyard that faced Mount Gamalama, so it was inevitable that our conversation should touch upon the, upon the dying clove trees that I had seen on the volcano slopes. Like so many others on the island, Mr. Shah attributed the death of the trees to climate change. This was for him a deeply troubling matter, since these trees had sustained his family's fortunes for 800 years. Given the seriousness of the situation, I asked him, do you think the people of Ternate should make an effort to cut back their carbon emissions? He answered in much the same vein as had others to whom I had posed the question. Paraphrase, the answer was as follows. Why should we cut back? Wouldn't that be unjust to us? The West had its turn when we were weak and powerless and they were our rulers. It's our turn now. The response came as no surprise to me. I've heard it's like many times, not just in Indonesia, but also in India, China, and many other places. What is notable about this response is the way in which it echoes the story told by the trees of Ternate. Its main themes are precisely mimesis, desire, envy, rivalry, power, the violence of empire, and finally, fairness and justice. But justice, too, in this case, is envisaged precisely as mimesis. The right to consume and pollute is established and justified by the fact of it having happened elsewhere in rich countries. This is a far cry from the case for climate reparations as articulated by many whose ecosystems and livelihoods are directly threatened by climate change. What these victims are asserting is merely that they and their accustomed ways of life have a right to survive, and that this imposes certain obligations on those whose actions are indirectly depriving them of the right. The prospect of achieving growth or a higher standard, standard of living figures nowhere on their horizon. The case for reparation, however, has been decisively foreclosed by the Paris Climate Agreement of 2016, which repudiates all future claims and liabilities on the part of wealthy nations. At the same time, the document implicitly endorses the assumptions about affluence and growth that prevail among policymakers everywhere, in rich and poor nations alike. And it thus itself rests upon a view of wealth as that which is possessed by others. As such, it is the very exemplification of Adam Smith's view of the economy as a sphere in which man deludes himself. The significance of the mimetic view of wealth becomes apparent if we contrast it with some lines that Mahatma Gandhi wrote in 1928. Quote, God forbid that India should ever take to industrialism after the manner of the West. If an entire nation of 300 millions took to similar economic exploitation, it would strip the world bare like locusts. Like many Gandhiisms, these words imply a radicalism that is not immediately apparent. What is Gandhi really saying? Is it possible that speaking on behalf of 300 million, he is renouncing the aspiration to what is regarded as wealth in the modern world? Yes, so he is. Is it possible that Gandhi is implying that his people, among the poorest and most oppressed in the world, will make sacrificial lambs of themselves so that others can continue to devour the world. Yes, so he is. Presented in this frame, Gandhi's words seem almost offensive today, in an Uncle Tom kind of way. Certainly no politician anywhere in the world would dare say anything like this now. If they did, they would be hounded into oblivion by their own people. And they would also be globally derided for condemning huge multitudes to poverty. 
Notable also is the anti-mimetic thrust of Gandhi's words. This is precisely why they affront the dominant notions of our time, the Anthropocene. This is a moment when death itself is preferable to the injustice of thwarted desire. Had Gandhi been alive now, he would probably have called for a counter-mimesis, in which the rich learn to live like the poor, at least in some respects. Even though this lesson of the Anthropocene is plain for all to see, there is only one major figure in the world today who has the courage to articulate it, Pope Francis. So I'll stop there. Thank you, Amit Gosh. Every book of yours is an amazing journey that gives, especially the Western reader, an experience of decentering, centering of history, the centering of geography. And this um, talk um, is yet another example of this um, all encompassing voyage that connects. Uh, places and themes that we're not used to associating. But um, I think we want to continue the conversation and you started from your recent book. So I'd like to ask you if you could please gloss um, over the title of the book. The book in English is called The Great Arrangement, Climate Change and the Unthinkable. In Italian, it has been translated like La Grande Cecità, using the image of blindness. So could you... Uh, Please explain the title, which is also the best introduction to the main argument of the book. Well, you know, uh, uh, the title really refers to uh, uh, something which I see in front of me every day in every possible way. Uh, but. In its most essential way, what it really refers to is the strange condition that we are in. You know, we live in an age which worships science. You know, where science is a fetish, and it has been for, uh, you know, 200 years. And yet, we find ourselves in a position where we are not able to pay heed to the most fundamental findings of this science, of climate science, you know. Scientists out there shouting themselves hoarse, trying to tell us. Uh, what is coming towards us. And we who think of ourselves as people who are guided by some sort of scientific rationale in most of our lives are completely unable to, uh, you know, uh, to take heed of this. But, you know, I see this derangement around me all the time. I mean, um, ever more so. I mean, you know, uh, I'll give you just one example. Uh, uh, last year, when this book came out in India, I was in Chennai, uh, a city that was, used to be called Madras. And Madras, uh, last year, was hit by this incredible rain bomb event, when the whole city was just completely submerged, and it was dreadful, people had a, a, you know, it was traumatic for the city. Just, uh, you know, uh, the rivers rose and, uh, you know, swamped the land and everything. A few months uh, after this, uh, when I was in Chennai, my visit coincided uh, with an announcement by a developer. He was developing uh, an ultra-luxury condominium right on the bank of the river that had flooded. And this condominium was to have a seven-story parking basement. You know, I mean, I think that really, and people uh, were rushing to buy these, uh, these apartments. Any day, if you look at the real estate announcements in Miami, Florida, you'll see exactly the same thing, you know? Uh, so, I mean, I think we see this derangement around us uh, all the time in every possible way. Can I jump in at this point? Um, maybe f first say a very quick word of thanks to you, Amitabh, for that fantastic paper. Thank you. And then also to our wonderful hosts, uh, Ian Bambizzi and Shilabasi and his colleagues. Um, and of course, a word of thanks to Eric Rickers for inviting us into this extraordinary 
project. Um, I wanted to pick up with the, the question of science um, and the almost a religious relation we can have toward it. In, in your book, you're, there, there's a moment where you're critical of Max Weber and uh, his idea that uh, Western modernity is disenchanted thanks to uh, the rationalization process that reaches its kind of extreme point in modern Western science as he understood it. Um, and, I, and I take your point there, and I think Weber would actually agree with you that if we take science to be the road to our happiness, we are in fact grown up children. He actually uses that line in his famous um, essay, Science as a Vocation, uh, which we'll see its centenary this, uh, this coming fall. Um, and, and Weber, as well as anybody else, is quite clear on the limits of science. And part of his concern in the discussion of science and science as a vocation is to emphasize the fact that our modern rational science cannot make any kind of judgment on questions of value or of meaning. And he points out that science can be quite effective in helping us to think in instrumental terms about means ends relations to achieve the ends that we desire to achieve. But science itself is not at all capable in helping us think about or respond to these questions of value or of meaning. Those, he tells us, we won't find with the sciences. Um, and that raises the question then concerning where our ultimate decisions are made concerning what we value, uh, what life means to us, and thus how we ought to be living. And so we know today very well from the scientists what is going on with our climate. And I think at that level, the, the problem we're confronting is not so much with climate deniers, of whom there are many in my own country, some of them in, in very high places, uh, frighteningly. And, 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 and the problem of science denial, uh, in fact, in, in the, the contemporary culture and politics in, in my country is, is really quite a problem. But I don't actually think the real issue is on the side of denial. The issue is that even those of us who know and who accept the science cannot manage to change the ways we live. Because the ways we live, as, as, you, as your paper pointed out beautifully, are driven by these uh, <coughs> forces of desire. Uh, and so I guess my question for you would be, how do you understand the interplay between intellect or reasoning and the cultivation of certain kinds of affection or the reorientation of desires within any attempt at response to the problem of climate change. Uh, and, and then maybe in relation to that, as that would relate to a project like the one we're beginning to build, what role might you see the humanities playing in addressing these questions of desire and of affection, which are not in fact treated very well, as Weber would have told us, by scientific means? Uh, yeah, that's a very uh, uh, interesting question. Uh, yes, I, I mean, I do think that, you know, this most obvious thing that, uh, you know, climate change at the end of the day is a fact of culture. What drives it is culture. And what, what drives it also is a pattern of desire that is sort of embedded within the culture. But I don't think that we can change this really by, <clears throat> by um, uh, you know, the, the problem arises really when we try to think of this as making changes in individual lives. I think there is no way that we can have any kind of impact on issues like this, so long as it is a question, uh, as we reduce it to a question of individual consumption, individual consumerism, individual desires. We know that, uh, you know, people, are able to limit their desires immediately within certain circumstances when a collective decision is taken. For example, during wartime uh, in, um, in England, for example, you know, they suddenly decided, well, you know, you have to ration certain things. Similarly, I mean, after all, 
you're from California. California is the home of desire. Uh, you know, I mean, it's sort of, uh, as it were, pioneered modern desire. And yet, you know, uh, when they instituted um, water rationing in California, uh, there was no popular protest. Uh, people accepted it, uh, really, which to me was really a startling thing. I thought that uh, they would resist, you know. So, you know, though I think it's within that model that we really have to start thinking about, you know, how to approach this. What is, uh, what is allowable? You know, what is allowable within a circumstance of um, uh, emergency, which is the emergency that we're in. Uh, as for, um, you know, uh, what we can do in terms of uh, thinking about these, uh, these questions in a center for uh, humanities or a center that addresses the great issues of our time, uh, I really think that, you know, the very unfortunate thing that has happened with climate change is that this whole discourse has been sort of cornered, if you like, by a global group of uh, specialists, some of whom are te technical people. Actually, they're all technical people of one kind or another. The economists and uh, engineers and entrepreneurs very often. So, you know, they are actually really completely unable to see that this is a problem of culture, that it's a problem of desire, it's a problem of, uh, you know, that is so profoundly rooted in culture. You know, uh, I have for these last uh, uh, two weeks been traveling around, uh, uh, around Italy, uh, uh, meeting immigrants, you know, in the, in the various centri di accoglienza and so on, you know in Sicily and also near Venice. And one of the really startling things that you find is uh, really that, uh, you know, the story we tell ourselves about uh, migration is that it's driven by external impacts. And it is, to a certain degree. There are people who are facing war and extreme want. But to an extraordinary degree, uh, what drives it is desire. You know, it's a fantasy, it's a dream. It's a, it's a desire of wanting to be in a place that you've seen on your, um, on your uh, cell phone. So I want to tell, you know, those uh, angry politicians uh, in Europe who are upset about immigration, if you really want to stop immigration, what you have to do is to shut down the advertising industry. That's really the answer. Well, so let me go back to the larger issue of representation. Uh, the book is divided into three sections. Part one is called Stories, Part two, History, and Part three, Politics. Um, we always try to persuade our students, uh, some of them are here today, that studying literature is a very profitable activity because literature. Um, expands the imagination, help us think the unimaginable or the unthinkable. And yet, you make a powerful case in the first section of the book that literature has failed to address climate change, which is really a striking and a provocative statement. Um, coming from English literature originally, where you think that everybody, everything is about the weather, you know, it's, it's, there's a long tradition in English literature of, of talking about the weather. This is really a surprising claim, and it's also something admirable from someone who has, in fact, shown that literature can really uh, make imagination travel far and wide. So uh, you point out, for instance, that it's difficult to write poetry talking about petroleum or nafta, if you're making a specific point about how certain things are not poetic. So can you say something more about this? How come that literature has failed the two? Or how do you see, uh, at some point, you also um, refer to the possibility of new genres or new types of book that, uh, books that could address climate change in, in, a, in a new way. So what is the kind, maybe this is something that is not yet in the book, you know, what's the new book that um, the Center for Humanity and Social Change invite a writer to write to address climate change? You know, far be it from me to tell other writers how they should write or what they should write about. Uh, that's not my, uh, uh, really, for me, uh, in a sense, this book is a kind of act of uh, introspection. 
I am trying to sort of understand why I myself, being so aware of these issues, uh, have been so uh, so little able to respond to them uh, adequately. Uh, as you say, you know, in English literature, weather often figures, but uh, there you have to remember that English literature, as we know it, really comes into being in a period of extraordinary climatic stability. That is the Holocene in the first instance, but the 19th century, which was a time of uh, climatic stability, except for you know a couple of volcano blasts and so on. But it really makes you wonder that if uh, you know you think of Wordsworth writing about daffodils, and then you look at the pictures of the Lake District now with these raging floods. Uh, you know, would Wordsworth have really uh, been writing about daffodils if he'd been uh, you know caught in one of these floods? Would Jane Austen uh, be writing uh, a Jane Austenish books if she'd been in the mid middle of the? incredible heat waves and I mean you know in English 19th century literature uh, women are fainting when the sun is up because it's so hot and uh, you know you think of the of the incredible heat that they that they face now you know I mean the 2005 European heat wave when what, what is it 70,000 uh, people died so uh, you know and that again is a question 70,000 people died you know I mean uh, this is much more than in the Balkan wars do you know of a single novel or film about the great heat wave of 2005? No, there isn't one. Uh, uh, you mentioned, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 language. And I think that is really a very important aspect. You know, you know let's just think of the sort of great, uh, uh, the, the great novels of the past that have actually responded to the world, uh, you know, the world that surrounds them. For me, the, the greatest novelist of that kind is, of course, Melville. And for Melville, you know, uh, uh, his whole world is alive. He makes no distinction uh, between human sensibility and animal sensibilities. And, I mean, that is, to me, the truly miraculous thing about Melville, that writing in the 19th century, for him, the non-human is as present as, uh, uh, as the human. He would have scorned your center for humanities. Uh, he would have wanted this, you know, a center for non-humanity. <laughs> you know, uh, but uh, there again, uh, let's think of 20th century examples. If you think of the, of some of the great environmental or, or the writers who've written about environment, actually, many of them are, uh, are Scandinavians. You think of Haldor Laxness writing about Iceland. You think of Knut Hamsun writing about uh, Norway. And you know, growth of the soil, for example. But if you look at, well, we have such novels in Bengali also. But if you look at these novels, what is so interesting about them is that the way they deploy language. You know, almost always you'll find in such a novel that they use local dialect, you know, to create a texture of language which is poetic, which holds together, uh, you know, which creates this sheen. Uh, in Bengali, there's a wonderful uh, novel called Tita Shakta Nudinna. Uh, a river called Titash, where the uh, you know the writer uses a sort of local dialect to create, as it were, this this environment which exists within words. You think today of a writer returning to those places, you know, to the uh, to the Iceland of Haldor Laxness, uh, to northern Norway, to the uh, to the Norway of Knut Hamsun. What is he going to see? What is he or she going to see? They're going to see retreating glaciers, uh, permafrost melt and rising sea levels. So they have to use these words. These are ugly words. You know, how do you maintain that poetic texture of language when you're using words like permafrost melt? You know, that's not in any dialect. So, you know, in effect, climate change has disrupted the texture of language just as profoundly as it's disrupted the environment. Uh, you know, uh, so, that entire sort of range of techniques is now uh, outside, uh, you know, our, our possible area of usage. So, you know, I think we still really, in so many ways, haven't, uh, haven't in a literary sense, begun to understand the impact of uh, these events upon the world. Maybe a follow-up, perhaps, to, to that set of issues. Um, Another reason you entertain for the failure of literature to really take up the question of climate change has to do with the collective character of the problem and the focus of the modern novel 
on the moral adventure of the individual. And you yeah. take up Updike and you, you resist him, you challenge him, but you also, in a sense, grant that there has been a privilege in the novel toward the direction of the individual and the individual's psychic experience and so on, and that this does not leave space for thinking a human collectivity of the kind that one would have to be engaging to address uh, climate change. Um, but I wonder also about the sense in which in the same period you're talking about there, we see not just a focus on the individual, as you point out in the modern novel, but also the emergence of a mass culture, a mass consumeristic culture, and a mass media culture, in which many would argue any real sense of the individual is a face. And so I, I wonder if you might have any thoughts on the relation between our difficulty in thinking about a collective humanity today fruitfully in the direction of climate change and this question of a focus on the individual on the one hand, but then perhaps also an effacement of the individual within these major tendencies of our, of our culture. Uh, that's a very interesting question. I, I, I think it's, uh, it's one of the sort of really startling paradoxes, uh, you know, that uh, we live in, uh, in an age when of complete homogenization of desire in a way that's really never existed on Earth before, you know, uh, where, as you say, the individual is often effaced. And this is one aspect of a sort of neoliberal culture that we live in. Uh, the other aspect of the neoliberal culture is that it, it immediately invites you to frame every problem as a problem of individual choice. Uh, you know, which is why, say, uh, we, think, we tend to think of climate change uh, in these terms as always being framed by uh, notions of individual choice. And yet, uh, we know that this is an issue that can't be solved uh, at, at an individual level. It can't even begin to be addressed at an individual level, uh, you know. So, uh, you know, what it really is, is that we actually see here the absolute triumph of a neoliberal ideology over the last uh, 40, 30, 40 years. And this triumph didn't come about by accident. I'll just give you one example. You know, John Steinbeck's uh, The Grapes of Wrath is to me, uh, as it were, a climate novel avant la lettre. You know, it's uh, such a powerful and uh, amazing novel, and really the first part of it, the first chapter of it, is some of the most breathtaking uh, uh, climate writing that exists, you know, when he's describing the dust bowl and so on. And again, it's a novel where the collective is absolutely at the center, uh, you know, of his, of his work. And Steinbeck, I, I, I can tell you, I think is outside the Western world, perhaps the most powerful American writer of the 20th century. I've met writer after writer, I remember Miathan Tint in Burma, the great writer, uh, saying, telling me that uh, Steinbeck was his greatest influence. I remember Pramodya Anantatur in uh, Indonesia telling me the same thing. Uh, innumerable Indian writers were telling me the same thing. Uh, so Steinbeck had this incredible power. Yet Steinbeck was loathed and reviled by his American contemporaries. Just the other day, I, uh, I saw uh, this memoir by uh, André Gide, you know, where he, uh, he recounts that he once wrote a positive review uh, of, uh, of The Grapes of Wrath. And he was so savagely attacked by, by his American friends that he gave up reviewing. Uh, uh, you know, so uh, the other writers, so what do we see here? We see in the 1960s, an America coming into being, which is projecting its image of itself, you know, as being uh, a land of wealth, a land of uh, individual dilemmas, individual traumas, perhaps, but not a land where poverty creates a trauma, where poverty creates uh, uh, those difficulties. And you know, that really reminds one also that, uh, you know, we tend to think of the 20th century of, as, as a time where uh, aesthetic and literary movements were, dis were driven by uh, aesthetic and literary concerns. But actually, uh, the major factors driving uh, 20th century, uh, late 20th century uh, aesthetics uh, was power. It was intelligence agencies. The CIA funded the first shows of abstract expressionism. Uh, they uh, very consciously promoted uh, certain kinds of writing as uh, an antithesis of what uh, the KGB, on the other hand, was promoting, which was social realism. 
So between these two, you know, uh, to a quite extraordinary degree, we see that really the aesthetics of the late 20th century is formed more by, uh, by considerations of power than by aesthetic concerns. Can I quickly respond to that? Because, um, of course, we are aware of this uh, entanglement of uh, certain uh, styles and movements with political uh, interest. On the other hand, uh, it could be argued that thanks to the more experimental and radical writers, uh, we have also become better readers of text. And at some point, you uh, emphasize the fact that neoliberalism has also produced a very specific discourse, certain language that we find, for instance, in, you know, in the Kyoto Protocol. And you talk about the opacity of the language of these agreements and the fact that it manages to avoid the use of you know, very straightforward categories such as catastrophe or disaster and use a lot of terms and phrases that in fact are trying to dilute the seriousness of the situation. So, uh, without going into a sort of a literary debate, but it seems to me that while in the first part of the book you say literature has in a way failed us in climate change, you still seem to um, say later on that it's very important to cultivate our ability to read text, to read text against the grain, to nurture this capability of the, the of humanity to develop critical thinking. Otherwise, we'll all be, in a way, um, controlled by this neoliberal thinking and, and, and discourse. Would that be? Um, yes, that's certainly well put. I mean, I should, uh, uh, I should, I should explain here that the last chapter uh, of my book is actually a comparison, uh, a literary comparison of the Paris Climate Agreement uh, and uh, Pope Francis's uh, Laudato Si. And I think it's a very interesting, uh, they're very interesting documents to read together because uh, the Paris Climate Agreement is actually, in a literary sense, an extraordinarily complicated text. It's very rhetorical. I mean, you know, this is a, it's like a 40 page document. Uh, and a large part of it, the first 20 pages, has two sentences. Uh, you know, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's in a rhetorical sense, I and mean, even in terms of its scansion, uh, it's sort of formed like poetry with these bizarre sorts of uh, periods and so on. Uh, the Pope, Lord Artasi, is by contrast uh, a truly an astonishing book. I mean, it's. Uh, the, the language itself is, uh, is one of such extraordinary uh, simplicity, you know, that you can see that he's trying to communicate with uh, really the world's poor. He's trying to find, as it were, he's trying to make a language that circumvents the gatekeepers of this problem, you know, and goes straight into the houses and the huts and the hearts of the poor, you know. Uh, so, uh, in a literary sense, I think it is a very, very remarkable text. Maybe to, to keep going with um, the, the really interesting work you do in that comparison with these two texts at the end. Um, I mean, this actually comes back to, to my first question about the interplay of science and affection or desire, uh, it's a point the Pope himself makes in that text that we cannot address this problem by means of technological expertise. Yes. The language of biology and mathematics, he says, will not be sufficient to addressing this problem. And so he does appeal very directly to the heart and to the cultivation of certain bonds of affection. Of course, his tradition, has a very rich account for the ways in which our loves have been disordered and misdirected. And uh, within that tradition, the only real answer in the end for the redirection of desire or love is grace. It's not something that we can do on our own uh, in our humanity. And so I'm wondering whether well, what would you do with the question of grace, given that you've invoked the Pope and, and his very rich thinking about this topic, but knowing that, that the answer to the misdirection of our loves within that tradition is something beyond the human, which 
which they would call grace. Do you see my question? I, I see. If, if that is, a, I think that is a question. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm not religious myself, and nor am I Christian. Uh, um, uh, you know. Uh, so I don't really. Uh, I mean, you know. At the end of the day, I'm, uh, I, I find myself having to think of this as something that humans have to address. At the same time, it, it's increasingly evident that humans have failed uh, to think of, uh, you know, to confront this or think of it. And the Pope's, the Pope's tradition would say that it's the, 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 the tendency toward human self-reliance that is the very problem. That's yeah. the, the first misdirection of love is in the direction of human self-reliance which can actually, I think, show up in its logic in paradoxical ways when we attempt to find technological solutions to technological problems. Uh, with the American writer Wendell Berry, agrarian thinker, very, very rich and important uh, thinker in my mind, he speaks about the madness of this faith we have in the technological, according to which problems that have been brought about fundamentally by our technological modes of being, we seek answers to, by yet more technology. And much of the discussion of environmental problems, including climate change and the rest, can seem to tend in that direction. We just apply more and more calculating rationality and technological expertise in the hope of solving problems that may have derived from their, those very modes of thinking to begin with. I completely agree. And, 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 and so then the paradox is, of course, we have to rely upon this kind of scientific insight and this kind of technological expertise and yet that seems clearly be not, not enough. Yes, absolutely. And I think, uh, you know, uh, Heidegger yeah. said this in 1964. He said, uh, only a god can save us now. I think it's, uh, it's increasingly evident. Can I take the privilege of the last question? Um, and this, uh, important question because both in the book and in your wonderful presentation you have talked about Venice. There is a very special and totally unexpected Venetian connection. At some point you uh, say that some of the um, ecological refugees from Bangladesh have made Venice their new home, perhaps for not for a long time. Uh, and what we've been discussing in days, what you've been doing these days in Venice is talking to uh, the Bangladeshi community also seems to reflect a much uh, broader understanding of the state of multiculturalism today. We are trying hard in Italy to build a multicultural society. Other societies, especially other European societies, have uh, been there before and they seem not to have done particularly well. So, um, or at least they've done really well in certain aspects and less so in other aspects. Um, and so, in conclusion, I know this is a big question, but can you tell us something about your Venetian experience that can also speak largely to where we're going in terms of imagining and uh, enabling a more multicultural society in Italy and elsewhere? Um, you know, we are in a circumstance now when, um, uh, you know, people keep talking about how the impacts of climate change are going to happen in the future. But it's perfectly evident that it's happening now. You know, we see it all around us. We see it. I mean, uh, I saw an Italian admiral the other day. He was quoted in the paper as saying that, uh, you know, uh, what is behind this problem is not, uh, you know, is not anything immediate. It's, uh, it's a much larger scale thing than, a, than the Italian Navy can possibly address. And it's true, you know, I mean, I think everybody at every level can see this. I remember, uh, you know, a very interesting discussion in Calpani Center with the, uh, uh, you know, with, uh, with the direttore of one of the, uh, of one of the receiving centers. And it was perfectly clear to him too that so many of, the, of uh, you know, the people who were coming uh, into his center had these wider impacts behind them, you know. So uh, the Bangladeshis, uh, uh, you know, the impact is never very direct. It's not like, uh, you know, uh, I mean, sometimes it does happen, but in, in, uh, only in a few cases that a, that a, a farmer uh, will find their land flooded. I've had a, I've met uh, several farmers like that. 
who had their land flooded and who moved to the city. But then once they start moving, they get caught in this sort of a constant network of movement which actually makes them move away. So you'll find that with a lot of the people who are here displaced, if you ask them whether uh, you know, uh, these impacts had anything to, the, to do with their movement, uh, they themselves will not notice it because their journeys begin with an internal displacement within Bangladesh, for example. Similarly, this is also true of uh, Egypt. Uh, I, I really met so many uh, young Egyptians from, uh, you know, the Said, which is the deep south of Egypt, uh, you know, and they all said, that, you know, we are out of land, we have no way uh, to sustain ourselves where we are. Equally interesting was something, uh, you know, uh, one of the major, uh, one of the centers that I visited in, uh, in Milan, actually, there were a lot of uh, Pakistanis. And these Pakistanis, uh, if you ask people uh, around the country, you'll see that in all these centers, a lot of these Pakistanis are from one place, which is a uh, very little known place. It's a sort of uh, small district called Gujarat, not the Indian Gujarat, but another Gujarat uh, in Pakistani Punjab. And when I asked them why they had moved and why there were so many of them there, it turned out that there had been a massive Indus flood. Uh, which had uh, displaced them, you know. Uh, I, I, I think the flood was not very long ago, 2013, 14, uh, and they've been moving since then. So you can see these impacts are already very much behind these uh, behind these movements. And uh, you know, the reality is this is not going to stop. You know, these movements are uh, are unstoppable. They're unstoppable because of the peculiar nature of your European geography, uh, of Indian geography. One of the things that I did discover and which has really surprised me is that there are very few Indians uh, in this mass migration. You know, I don't know why that should be the case because it's not like there isn't. Uh, I mean, that, it's not like India is not feeling the impacts. But if uh, an outflow like this starts from India, then I mean, my God, I don't know what we'll be facing. On this note, yeah. I want to thank Amitabh Ghosh very, very much. Thank you. And I'd like to thank Thomas and Shaul for their wonderful question. The event continues downstairs with a little reception so we'll uh, celebrate and once again also hmm? down, down. down down yes we're all the way down to the courtyard and once again thank you very much to Eric Rickmers and to Michele Bugliesi for making this possible. Thank you, thank you. Thank you Tom.